Amen. What a powerful series of readings as it is, isn't it? Just, just kind of reading through the narrative in Luke and then looking back into the Old Testament and seeing these things. We could just pick and choose from so many places. But you see how this, the Bible fits together in such a powerful way. I wanted to think, and I'm going to do this briefly this evening, so don't worry, this will be a briefer message than usual. <laughs> but uh, just briefly to think about, well, Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve in particular. It's just interesting because it's a time of, that evokes powerful emotions. I don't need to tell you that. It was, for me, absolutely and without doubt, my favorite day of the year when I was a kid. And I'm going to be honest with you. You know, my, they try to say it's about Jesus or it's about, it's about learning how to give. It's like, no, it was about getting presents. <laughs> it was unbelievably exciting for me. I mean, un, un, it's just a day in which you would receive presents. Are you kidding? It was like this amazing day. I have so many memories, so many good memories in my life locked up and connected with this. We used to give our gifts on Christmas Eve and we'd sit around and it, it's such a powerful combination of so many of the best things in my life. I have these memories of my family. I remember walking around in New York City. Now, New York City in the 1970s was a dump. We're getting back to that again, by the way, but it was a terrible place to be. But it was like on this one day a year, people would actually be friendly. Like the Irish and Puerto Ricans wouldn't be fighting in my neighborhood. Everybody would be like, oh, how are you? You know, nice to see you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was a day when it was like, it was this time of, it was this one day, maybe two days, when you were nice to one another, when there was human goodness on display. And I, I love that. Here's the thing about Christmas that I think is interesting. It's very easy to start sentimentalizing Christmas or start getting into all these sort of side categories about what it's about because these memories are so strong in us. It evokes these powerful memories of all that's good in life, and these are good things. The memories of our family, the memories of like the light in the darkness, all the lights when you walk around, these are wonderful things, these reminders of God's goodness. But what's it really about, right? We've said this for years. You all know at every church you've ever gone to, who's the reason for the season? Of course, it's Jesus. But I want to say something more. Even when we bring it back to Jesus, that too can become like a type of religious kitsch, if you're not careful about it. it could become, we can re-sentimentalize it all over again. So, oh, we'll just keep it on Jesus. It's all about the babe in the manger with the cattle and no crying he makes. You know, by the way, that's my favorite song. I just love Away in a Manger. I love singing it. I'm not the curmudgeon you think I am, maybe a little bit, but it's like theologically, can we acknowledge that that's dubious? The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I don't know about that. It's even bad theology if you think about it. The whole point is that he's, he, he became as one of us. He probably did cry, you'd hope, right? Now, I'm being silly about this, but it, there's something serious here. There's a, there's a tendency to become, without even intending to be, sort of sentimental about this. And the problem with this, I want us to, I was thinking about this, maybe it's because I'm in a weird mood or something. <laughs> for the past couple of weeks, I really thank you for your prayers. My family's been through it. You know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I had COVID and influenza at the same time, which is a real doozy. And interestingly for me, it wasn't that hard in terms of the, uh, the actual sickness, but it's this after effect where my head is still foggy. <laughs> and so I'm talking to you now for a bit of a fog. And in a funny way, I prayed about this over the last several days for help. Lord, what is, you know, what, how do I, how am I going to come and preach about Christmas when I'm feeling oddly disconnected this way? And then I realized, you know, this is a funny gift from God. I want to talk to you about it a little bit. I'm going to talk about that more tomorrow. But for tonight, I want to just bear us down on this one central message of Christmas for this year, which is that in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the baby Jesus, what we're seeing here is God revealed. When you take away all the sentimental stuff and what's some, there's something really shocking and it actually causes people to stumble if you get right to it. What we're talking about is the revelation of God. Now, let me talk about just Christmas for a second because it's kind of fun to think about the holiday. You know, it's like we're celebrating on December 25th. And once again, I'm not going to be the curmudgeon that says, oh, you, you know, we shouldn't be celebrating on December 25th, you know, because we don't know if that's his real birthday. And I'll talk about that more tomorrow. <laughs> But you're probably aware, you've heard it before, that Christmas, the time of year, also overlapped very closely with this old Roman holiday of Saturnalia, right? 
And that's always put out there. Here's the problem with Christmas over the centuries, is that it got kind of paganized. So the practice of Christmas, here we are, we're supposed to be gathering to remember the birth of the Lord Jesus, but it's also an opportunity to have a whole bunch of reveling and carousing and stuff, because that was the overlap with the holiday. And then over time, so by the 1600s and 1700s, Christmas was this time of just rowdiness and reveling. Right. And on top of that, we've since added this whole what I'm going to call the Scandinavian layer that for some reason we have like this guy with white hair and the beard and the red and he's fat and running around and coming down chimneys. And it's all the North Pole and reindeer and cold. And you're wondering, what in the world? How did we get here? (laughs) It's kind of interesting to think about that here. We're talking about the birth of Jesus in Galilee in the first century. And over that is this Roman holiday. And over that is this kind of Scandinavian stuff. Throw in Santa. Right. Well, tonight I want to talk about Santa, the real Santa. Who's the real Santa? Saint Nick. And I'm not talking about jolly Saint Nick who comes down to the poem I read tonight before this service tonight. You know the poem, right? Jolly Saint Nick and he's fat and he's the real Saint Nicholas is an interesting character. And I don't know how they came up with this new character from this character. What do you know about the real Saint Nicholas from Asia Minor 270? until 343 AD, and he was not a fat, jolly guy. In fact, he was a pretty fierce dude. He was a guy that was completely, you know, dedicated, I mean, on fire for the Lord, and he was fierce in his defense of the vulnerable and those who were oppressed, and he was absolutely fearless and courageous in his condemnation of those who oppressed people. He's like this saint of God at that time. And what's really funny about it is he probably might have heard this through the grapevine, but what cracks me up about the real St. Nicholas is that he actually slapped the heretic (laughs) Arius in the middle of the Council of Nicaea. And that's what I want to talk about. I want you to think about that, this picture of Santa Claus slapping the heretic. That's interesting. Is anyone familiar with Arius? We're going to talk about this a little more detail tomorrow. But Arius was this guy who was coming along and trying to defend his idea of, like, God's integrity. It sounds confusing to say that somehow, how could Jesus be God? If you think about it, that might be confusing, right? We just read it tonight. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. Is anyone confused yet? (laughs) The early church really tried to work this through and came up with all kinds of false leads on this. And Arius was one lead on this. He was basically saying, oh, Jesus is exalted indeed, but he was created by God. There was a time when the son of of God wasn't, okay? And basically, this was seen as an assault on the very essence of the Bible. This is really important stuff. Again, we'll talk about this tomorrow. But to understand God is sort of like the foundation of understanding anything else we want to talk about. And what Scripture reveals about God is that God is this trinity, right? Three persons in one God. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each of the persons in themselves all the attributes of God, right? So it's not like the Son of God is a little bit less God than the Father, right? This is what Scripture teaches when you look into this stuff. And this is what they were working out at the council. And this is what the real Saint Nick was defending, this idea. Now, I want to talk about the person of Jesus. It's interesting. Do you ever think about this? Do you ever start wondering? It's like, well, when Jesus was born, what was Jesus before? Like, how is this what, what happened to the Son of God before that? Do you ever think about these things? Because if, if you do, when you go off on your own without thinking about in terms of what the church has thought about through, through a lot of hard thinking about this stuff, it's very easy to get confused and to go off track. Now, by the way, are you going to go instantly to hell if you think have any wrong thoughts about theology? Anyone? No! So then what's important about theology? What's important is, is that bad theology in the end corrupts the church. It leads us astray. Bad theology leads to bad practice. And so what I want you to see this evening is one big thing. Such a cool idea. Such a cool truth. Is that when we're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, we talk about Jesus, you know, one person and two natures. The person of Jesus Christ is none other than the second person person in the Trinity, the Son of God. What I want you to see there is to think about that. That second person of the Trinity never stopped being God, never stopped. Did you ever wonder about that? Did he say, what happened to God the Son in the years when he, did he stop being God? No. 
Just think about this for a second. We'll expand on this tomorrow. But what I want you to see tonight is, what do you think when you think about God? If you're like me, you think of majesty, inaccessible light, glory, holiness, right? The, all these words that you could come up with. What you might not think, though, is this picture that he's given us of Jesus in the manger. God came to be with us. And God, what is God like? And what God is inviting us to do is, you know what God is like? What? Look at Jesus. What is the love of God like? We can come up with all kinds of fine abstractions. Whoa, the love of God is like this and like this. But the answer is the love of God is like Jesus. The love of God is embodied in Jesus. And God has given us this revelation of himself. And it's an extraordinary thing. That when we look, when we think about Christmas Eve this year, that's what I want you to think. A pretty simple thought is that what we're looking at is God revealed. Do you remember in Jesus' life, he's walking with his disciples and one of his disciples, Philip, asks him this question. Philip comes up to him and says, Lord, would you show us the father? Would you reveal to us the father? We'd like to see God the father. That would be awesome. Do you remember what Jesus said to him? Philip, how long have I been walking with you and you're asking me this? Don't you know that to look at me is to see the Father? What does he mean by that? What, you can see through me to the Father? No, to look at me is to see the Father. Is that Jesus has come. Jesus reveals the Father. Do you want to know what God is like? Look to Jesus. The gift of Christmas, I want to suggest... It's this message for us that I want to look at that without the sentimental stuff necessarily, though that's all good. But let's look and consider this Christmas that God came to be here with us. God himself concretized his love for us in the person of Jesus. God came to us. He became like us in order that we might become like him. He came to us in order that we might be brought closer to him. The message of Jesus is really simple, is that God is with us. God is for us, always in the person of Jesus. And that is a good reason for a praise. So with this said, I wanted to read those lines from uh, Isaiah 9 again. Just think about this. For, uh, to, for to us, a child is born. For to us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That was the promise. So this Christmas, amidst all the hubbub of things, amidst all the sort of distractions of things... Keep this in mind that God has come to us. God comes to us in the person of Christ. And as he said at the end of Matthew, I will be with you always. The second person of the Trinity is with us. And what we as a church look forward, looking back to when he was with us in, in his human nature, in his body, and we look forward to that day when he'll be with us again. This evening, let's rejoice that God is with us who believe in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.